Okay, good morning. Um, uh, I'd like to formally open the meeting and welcome members of the committee and all those present to the 13th meeting of the Devolution for the Powers Committee. Um, we have an apology from Duncan McNeill. I go straight to agenda item two, evidence session at stage one of the Scottish Elections Reductions on Voting Age Bill. Uh, well, welcome our final panel witnesses on the stage one consideration of the Scottish Elections Reductions on Voting Age Bill to the evidence session. Um, the witnesses are uh, John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Con Constitution and Economy. Helen Clifford uh, is team leader in the franchise team. Gillian Cross, a uh, policy advisor in the franchise team. Stuart Forbester um, from Divisional Solicitor of the Legal Directorate and Willie Fernie from the Parliamentary Council of the Scottish Government. We've got about an hour to take evidence, folks. Um, so I'd appreciate that members made their questions as synced as possible. And and, so, and same would go to witnesses. Uh, I think the Deputy First Minister would like to make an opening statement, and please proceed. Uh, thank you, Convener. I welcome the opportunity to give evidence to the Committee on the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. Uh, can I start by extending my thanks to all those who have given their time and expertise during what has been a compressed timetable for the development of this bill. The Committee has heard evidence from many of those involved last week, and I was pleased to note that they welcomed uh, what we have made of the advice that they have provided to us in this process. Uh, Parliament's decision to extend the vote to 16- and 17-year-olds for the referendum and their subsequent participation is widely seen as having been a major step, for step forward in democratic participation in the democratic process. The Committee's report into the operation of the referendum concluded that the decision on lowering the voting age had been a success. That assessment has been repeated on a number of occasions in Parliament since last September, not least during the consideration of the Section 3063 order, which transferred the necessary powers to allow us to lower the voting age to 16 in time for the 2016 Scottish parliamentary elections. The order was approved unanimously by this Parliament and came into force on the 20th of March. Less than two weeks later, I introduced the bill. The powers which were transferred to the Scottish Parliament by the Section 30 order are tightly drawn and will be followed in due course by full powers over Scottish Parliament and local authority elections, as recommended by the Smith Commission. In the meantime, the powers we have allow the reduction in the minimum age to 16 for Scottish Parliament and local authority elections and allow the Scottish Parliament to make adjustments to registration arrangements to give effect to the reduction in the voting age. Through the Bill and the associated practical arrangements, we are seeking to balance transparency of the electoral process with the need to treat young people's data with sensitivity and ensure that the youngest voters can participate fully in the democratic process. The arrangements are intended to put young voters on an equal footing with all other voters, not least because this is now intended to be a permanent reduction in the voting age for Scottish Parliament and local government elections, while at the same time ensuring that their data is treated sensitively and responsibly. The Bill's general approach is therefore to replicate current registration practice for the youngest voters as far as possible. It does this by applying existing electoral legislation, amending that where necessary to take account of the reduction in the voting age to 16. The proposed arrangements also reflect the introduction of individual electoral registration and draw on the success and the experience of the referendum. The Bill provides for restrictions on access to and disclosure of information on 14 and 15 year olds and provides for enhanced arrangements for particular groups of vulnerable young people, such as those who require to register anonymously and those who need to register by way of a declaration of local connection rather than use their current address. The arrangements we put in place for the referendum were well received and supported by members of Parliament, child protection groups and electoral administrators before and after the referendum. As the committee would expect, the provisions in this bill are designed to create broadly the same effect as the arrangements which proved such a success last September. We are proposing to do some things different in this bill, where it makes sense for the voter and provides for the more effective and efficient process for electoral administrators. And I look forward to discussing the bill's uh, proposals with the committee today. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Can I just begin just by asking a very general question about how your consultation with organisations uh, and those representing young people have influenced the outcome of the bill? Um, I think it would be useful to hear from the government's perspective. Obviously, we have taken a fair bit of evidence from individuals around that. So just knowing what, um, what consultation processes went on and, and how, how they managed to influence the bill and shape it would be useful. Thank you. We essentially undertake, undertook consultation, I suppose, in two spheres, convener. One was with the electoral professionals um, who 
run the electoral registration process and all of the stakeholder community associated with that, the Electoral Commission, the Information Commissioner, um, all of these organisations, um, the uh, software providers uh, and all of uh, yeah, and to make sure that the practical contents of the bill could actually be delivered um, if they were enacted. And then secondly, we undertook uh, discussions with um, a variety of other stakeholder interests around the interests of youth involvement in youth participation, child protection and um, some of the um, wider organisations looking at the welfare of children in particular circumstances, um, particularly um, organisations involved in uh, supporting looked after children um, where there are particular uh, and sensitive issues that have to be addressed. Um, essentially, the, the, the outcome of that work has been absorbed into the formulation of the bill as far as we possibly could do. And uh, I certainly think from the discussions that I've seen the committee undertaking with a variety of these interests, I, I, it gives me the impression that, broadly speaking, the approach the government has taken in understanding and listening to the issues raised by these organisations um, has been well received in the way in which we've taken forward the bill. Okay. Uh, you mentioned specifically lo looked after children issues in, in part of your response to every first minister. I know that Lewis MacDonald and a couple of us had a particular interest in that, so I'll come to Lewis first. Th thank you very much. And uh, clearly the provision in the bill that makes particular provision for looked after children is, is welcome and the encouragement or the requirement for local authorities to uh, support looked after children and registering and so on. I wonder if uh, the Deputy First Minister would like to expand a little on how that will uh, work in practice and how local authorities will be uh, assisted to deliver on their obligations in that regard. Essentially, the, the, there will be a number of approaches taken here at Covina. I think the first general remark I would make is that the approach that has been taken is broadly consistent with what was undertaken in the referendum last, in the run to last September. Um, so, for example, in relation to uh, anonymous registration, which was particularly relevant in this area, existing electoral law requires proof in the form of a listed court order or interdict or attestation by the chief social worker or police officer um, of superintendent rank or above that the safety of an individual or someone living with them would be at risk if the register disclosed their name and address, and that's fully reflected in the uh, proposals that we bring forward. Um, there is also provision for the declaration of local connection um, where um, th there can be um, a necessity to ensure that th there is awareness amongst local authorities of the necessity to consider that factor in undertaking um, any registration that uh, will be taken forward. Um, in terms of the encouragement to local authorities to extend awareness of the provisions that can be taken forward to support, to, to enable the registration, particularly of looked after children. Um, you know, we, will, we will work with local government to support them in ensuring that there is the widest possible awareness that these provisions exist and can be deployed so that the option is available to individuals. And the, the bill requires each local authority to promote awareness of the registration arrangements amongst looked after children and um, local authorities will have to determine what action is necessary in that respect. Um, but we'll work with um, relevant organisations to provide the necessary guidance and support to local authorities, which fits into the wider corporate parenting responsibilities for which local authorities carry uh, that obligation. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, very, that's a welcome approach. I think that's the right approach. As well as the disadvantage, though, that looked after children clearly uh, have in many respects, there's a particular challenge for young people who are moving out of uh, a looked-after environment into the wider community. And some of the evidence we heard last week suggested that more could be done or should be done to ensure that those young people are aware of their rights and responsibilities, including in relation to, to voting if they're, if they're leaving care at, at, at 16 or 17. 
I think, Convener, that's a, it's a, a, a pretty significant and fair issue. And I think we, uh, I think the, the, there is a general point, which I, I think Mr McDonald's question covers, which is about the, just the, the difficulty of young people moving out of a situation of being looked after, just in general in society, about the whole multiplicity of different issues that they, they face. So therefore, I think it, it, it essentially will be no different in relation to electoral registration. So it's important that we have a particularly tailored approach to meet the needs of what's a relatively small cohort within our society, but an important cohort that need to be supported in as much as the state would provide support for young people moving through this journey in relation to, or should provide support uh, to young people moving through this journey in relation to housing or employment or healthcare or wellbeing services, it's important that that is specifically taken forward in relation to electoral registration. So we'll reflect on that uh, suggestion and make sure that there is um, particular provision put in place to, to, to reflect the concerns that have been raised. There is nothing in the bill that um, prevents us from doing that and everything in the bill that provides the opportunity to do so. But I think it's a, it's a fair and substantial point that we'll take forward. Thanks very much. Stuart Millen, I think you had to... Yeah. So much of it actually has been dealt with with uh, Deputy First Minister's answers, but just uh, kind of one uh, question, if I may. Is that in terms of I mean, the points that, uh, that have been raised thus far, uh, has the Scottish Government actually had any discussions up to now with local government regarding these particular issues? That uh, discussion hasn't started today, other than the fact that we've obviously talked closely to the... Um, to the electoral registration officers and they will be at the very heart of the registration process. So um, the, 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 the discussion will predominantly be taken forward through the ERO channel, but obviously we'll have to make sure that there are appropriate connections to other um, social, social work and social welfare services that can provide the necessary input to ensure that the young people that are referred to and Mr McDonald's question can be appropriately contacted and supported to ensure that they can fulfil their democratic rights if they wish to exercise them. Okay. Thank you. That's it. A couple of other individuals, I think, indicated other supplementaries. Mark, I think you were for. <coughs> yeah, Commissioner, it's probably the appropriate point to, to, to raise this. At the last uh, evidence session, I raised the point of while we're, there was a lot of evidence around uh, 16, 17 year olds in. Um, schools and colleges, there will be a small number, we we'll hope it's a small number, who will fall into the not in education, employment or training category. Does the Scottish Government have any considerations as to how to promote registration to, to this cohort or, or would that be expected to be captured within a wider information programme? Essentially that would be part of the challenge of electoral registration and there will be you know, the, 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 there will be the, uh, the normal canvas activity to identify who are the eligible individuals who should be added to the register. And I, I think that that, by its nature, is a comprehensive process involving um, the, the, the canvas activity that is undertaken to ensure we get to as complete a register as we possibly can do. It will obviously also be complemented by the messages around the importance of registration, which will be more widely and publicly communicated, um, and we've seen in the run-up to the current general election campaign, really quite a sustained effort, and we saw it also in relation to the referendum, a sustained public messaging uh, campaign to ensure that people um, take up the opportunity to register democratically. So I think there'll be. Um, there will be a, a comprehensive effort put in place there, and I would be confident, based on our recent experience, that we can maximise that registration as a consequence of raising that awareness. Okay. Stuart, uh, Maxwell. Yes, um, the, 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 of the, um, uh, the areas of the Children and Young People Act <laughs> that deal in particular with uh, aftercare and the expansion of continuing care um, and to an older age group, and particularly those who, uh, who are not necessarily looked after at this point, but you know, were looked after in the past uh, and are now in receipt of uh, new and additional services they were, were not entitled to before the Children and Young People uh, Act came into effect. Uh, these are currently going through the Parliament, through the Education Committee, in, in, in the form of subledge. Now, Celsus suggested to us that the bill could be amended 
to give consideration to effectively um, ensuring that local authorities promote awareness and registration, etc., and support for this particular group. And I just wonder if there's been any thought about how uh, the work of local authorities uh, and the bill itself will, will effectively match up with the expanded support provided by the Children and Young People Act. I, I think the terms of the bill are cast in such a fashion to give us the opportunity to take forward that and fulfil the obligations of the Children and Young People Bill in terms of the, the powers that the bill takes forward and the obligations that it takes on in relation to registration. Having said that, uh, I am open to considering the issue that's raised, um, that Mr Maxwell has raised, because I think you know, I'd want to signal to the committee this morning my desire to ensure that we uh, fulfil this capability uh, as much as we possibly can do. So if there, is a, if there is another level of legislative provision that we need to consider, then we will certainly consider that. But I don't see anything in the bill that impedes us from fulfilling, uh, fulfilling this obligation. But uh, obviously, I'll consider the issues that have been raised. Uh, and, and if I feel there is uh, further provision, then obviously the government will engage constructively on that point. Thank you. Thank you. Alison Johnson, I think actually your question of disabilities would follow quite neatly into this question area as well. Yes, I'm following on from the questions about looked after children who, who are often overlooked. Um, young people with disabilities, um, we're hearing from organisations representing um, them last week, and uh, there's a feeling that certainly in the past people with physical disabilities and with learning disabilities have often been persuaded that voting isn't something they should take part in. just wondered if this bill gives us an opportunity to address that, um, just to make sure that it's as easy as possible to get to, voting, to a polling station, where that's not possible, that postal votes have been discussed with the young people. And also even thinking about the materials that come through the post from political parties. You know, are they really appropriate for all age groups and for those perhaps with learning or, or other disabilities? I think the, the, in terms of the, the general provision of this bill, I'm satisfied that this bill is cast in a fashion that makes it, um, that essentially creates the opportunity for all 16 and 17 year olds to be able to vote in Scottish parliamentary and local authority elections. So in terms of that, legislative provision, I'm absolutely confident that it is, a, it, it is defined in a way that makes it possible for everybody to be able to, um, to be eligible to, 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 to vote in that age category. I think we then go on beyond that to the questions around the, the messaging and the motivation to, to enable young people to participate in the electoral process. In that respect, I think it comes down to how we design the campaigns that encourage voter registration and participation. And some of that um, needs to reflect the particular circumstances and needs of individuals, uh, either um, in terms of physical access to vote. Um, you know, they're, they're all polling places will be obliged under the existing legislation to be physically accessible for all individuals. Um, postal vote opportunities are now, if I think back to when I started out in this activity um, more than 30 years ago, um, postal votes were, you had to have a really good reason for having a postal vote that was not available as openly as a postal vote is available just now. You really had to prove that you had an absolutely definitive reason why you couldn't get to the polling station. Uh, you know, postal votes are now much more readily available with the right scrutiny in place. Uh, but I do think these opportunities have to be made available to people. They need to understand they're available to enable them to then uh, exercise their participation. Um, as for the leaflets of political parties, um, well, I'm going to take absolutely no uh, responsibility for them uh, whatsoever. Um, uh, that's for the political parties to get on with and um, 
it's hard enough to get agreement about the contents of political party leaflets without getting agreement around the committee room tables about what should be in party leaflets. But I do think Alison Johnson makes a fair point about the, the need for, uh, for materials and messages to be available in an accessible form to all individuals. And certainly for our part, on registration campaigns and participation campaigns, we would ensure that uh, all of our approaches were structured in a fashion uh, to make that possible and practical. Thank you. Linda Fabiani. Um, morning. Uh, we have had discussion in this committee and indeed taken evidence from young people when we were scrutinising the referendum uh, process that there was a, a discontent about how local authorities, ergo schools, um, participated so that 16 and 17 year olds could have full discussion of what was going on. Um, we raised this last week at committee, and I was, was quite surprised at the strength of feeling uh, amongst um, those who represented young people and indeed um, very well articulated by the chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament that they felt that what happened over the referendum was entirely inadequate. Uh, there was a strong view, stronger than I thought it would be, that... Um, despite it being the responsibility of local authorities, um, that there should be national guidelines, is what was actually put forward, that uh, local authorities, education authorities, could tap into to determine um, openness in schools. And I hesitate to say education, because a lot of these young folk, it's not education they're needing, it's discussion and the ability to discuss openly like everyone else. Um, how education authorities and schools deal um, with elections when 16 and 17 year olds, their pupils will be able to vote. And I, I would just like a, an initial view um, from a Deputy First Minister as to how his government sees this and whether that's something that can be discussed perhaps by other colleagues. I think there's a, um, my, my general view is that um, there should be absolutely nothing that stops um, a fair and dispassionate understanding of the political process and the political choices within the education system. And I, I just think it's absurd that um, there should be any practical impediment in that actually happening. I think in, during the referendum, I think I picked up some, well, I certainly picked up anecdotal experience where there was a, a sensitivity being expressed about, you know, ab about the referendum debate coming into the school and somehow that that was not, you know, that wasn't desirable. But, you know, as, as certainly my experience of interacting with young people, and particularly the eligible 16 and 17 year olds and the very frustrated 15 year olds who couldn't get to vote, um, that the, there was a, a, a real appetite and a zeal to be involved in this discussion. Um, so I think there's, if there's um, if there's unease about that within the um, the education community, I think it's unfounded because I think part of this, the the education process, uh, if you look at the, the, the foundations of curriculum for excellence, curriculum for excellence is is at the heart of um, uh, curriculum for excellence is the whole concept of citizenship education and enabling our young people to fulfil their potential within our society. And in my view, part of that involves fulfilling their potential in the democratic process. Mm -hmm. the, the absolute stipulation must be that it all has to be fair and dispassionate. It has to give young people the opportunity to participate equally, to understand all the choices, to understand all the choices fairly and squarely and without prejudice. Um, and that, to me, is the crucial characteristic of what should be taken forward and there should be no impediment to that within the schools of Scotland. Now, um, guidance um, and educational resources for teachers on political literacy are available from the Education Scotland website and that guidance emphasises the importance of young people receiving information on political events such as elections in that balanced and impartial way that I've, that I've talked about. So I think the, the provision is all there um, to make sure it happens. I, I just think we've got to make sure it's, it is delivered in that fair and balanced way. Thank you. Tavish? Yeah, 
Can I just um, follow Linda Fabian's line of questioning? I would take it from your answer, which I thought was very fair, that you haven't, the government haven't received any um, overt representations on this point from either local government, from other sectors, including, for that matter, the Scottish Youth Parliament. There hasn't been a great uh, outpouring of, of angst about this issue to government in respect of this bill and, therefore, the need for the guidance that Linda was very fairly describing earlier on? There's nothing that's come to us in that, no. No, so your view would be that what is currently there in terms of the Education Scotland website uh, and that being fairly available to all is, is adequate in relation to local authorities' I, I, proper role in this area? I, I, th I think that, you know, the, 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 at the heart of the, the guidance is the necessity... Well, it was really the, the, the points that I, I mentioned there, the, the importance of young people receiving information on political events such as elections yeah. in a balanced and impartial way. Absolutely. And I think that, that's at the foundation yeah. of the, the guidance that's available. I think when the guidance leaves the website and goes into the school, we may come across some of the issues that I referred to in my earlier answer to Linda Fabiani, that there may be a sensitivity about you know, this, this debate is getting very intense, should we have this in the school, etc., etc. But in my experience, um, the, this can all be handled in a, a perfectly rational, considered, dispassionate way, and it's important because it then... It, gives young people the access to the knowledge uh, and the information that they can then mine uh, to their own convenience or to the extent of their interest uh, to find out more on these questions. Thank you. Um, the first one, I was very interested in hearing myself because in the evidence we took from the Electoral Commission, I, I felt that they had, a, in this regard, had a pretty hands-off approach. Um, and, uh, and they have a duty to promote, etc., do you think there is a, a stronger role for the Electoral Commission to be involved in helping um, Education Scotland and education authorities actually fashion something that at least pro provides a, a minimum base requirement of what goes on? And I think from all of our experiences during the referendum, the period where it became most disjointed between local authorities was the very time that young people wanted to be engaged, and that was during PURDA. And, and then and local authorities across the country took a, a different view of what they should do, do during that period. So there, are, I think there may be well some real issues that the Electoral Commission could help um, the, the, the various education authorities and Education Scotland produce at least some minimum you know, standard that needs to be set. I don't, know, I don't know how you feel about that. I, certainly, I, I, I would certainly be happy to explore these issues, convener. I think the... You know, the Electoral Commission has a statutory role to set out the, the manner uh, and the style and the content of awareness raising on the electoral process. And I don't think that's particularly different for people um, over 18 and under 18. Uh, I think it's, you know, it, 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 it's the same type of material. I think so, so the Commission in that respect has to fulfil that statutory test and Parliament has to be satisfied that that is being undertaken to, to our confidence. When it then comes to how that then flows into schools, in my answer to, to Mr Scott uh, essentially is my view that I think the, the guidance that's available is perfectly adequate to enable this issue to be um, to be handled appropriately and dispassionately within our schools. I think we would perhaps get into trouble as if we then have, as, as, as happens, I, I know the great word purda sends people into almost frozen status, that nothing can happen because it's purda. It's a nonsense. There's been, lots of things can happen. And, you know, there's an election, for heaven's sake. And... Young people have got to participate. So I think that I, I, I certainly wouldn't dispute that PURDA gets used as an almighty excuse for nothing happening and for things being stopped because it's PURDA. So I'm very sympathetic. I might be displaying some of my irritation about this point, which is currently with me. But, um, you know, so I, I, quite, I, quite, I quite accept there may be a problem of the translation of the guidance into what actually happens because people get frightened by, oh my goodness, I don't want to do something that breaks PURDA, which is, you know, it's going to be kind of hard to do if you're actually, if there's an election on 
and you're handling things fair and square and dispassionately within the classroom. And that's where I think we, you know, I, I, I could certainly foresee circumstances where a classroom teacher might be, you know, put into a position where they are dissuaded from uh, taking forward some part of the electoral awareness process because some local authority official has warned them about the great P word. So I, I, I wouldn't, I, I certainly can concede that point and and that, um, you know, and that is what we, you know, we need to make sure the guidance is properly understood, not improperly understood, which in certain circumstances around the question of PARDA, I would accept as the case. Okay, Rob. Yeah. Follow on from that, uh, convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think we've got this situation where um, the problem of translation of guidance is something that really is. Uh, down to a degree of confidence in the organisations concerned. You know, having been a teacher, I think the problem of risk aversion from teachers to head teachers to local authority managers is a big one. And I think that the evidence that we took and received during the referendum campaign highlighted that considerably. So when the Electoral Commission says in further evidence to us after last week, that people should be confident that their voices count. That word confidence jumps out at me. And I don't think it's a matter of the guidelines. I think it's a matter of the uh, ethos, the way in which we're encouraging people to be a part of this process that has to be conveyed to the uh, people from the classroom to the administrators. And somehow or other, that's not captured just in the bare question of the guidelines. I, I agree with that point. I, I think Mr Gibson sums up um, perfectly what I've been trying to say. Uh, that's the, I think it's in the guidance to me seems absolutely comprehensible and crystal clear as to what can be done. But I do concede that there will be on occasions a nervousness within uh, the, the, the school system that somehow they may be transgressing across guidelines and and and. and Clearly, members of the teaching profession want to operate within the correct statutory framework. So I, I, we'll give some further consideration to that issue. And obviously the committee may wish to deliberate on this point into the bargain. Because, But I do think it's about the, the distinction that Mr Gibson makes between the guidance and the ethos. And um, it's in my opinion, the resolution of this issue is all within the ethos and not the guidance. Yeah. Thank you for that. Stuart Maxwell, I think you had questions about data issues, I think, and young it people. Is, yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the policy memorandum, uh, Deputy First Minister, um, talks about the existing rules and protecting voter data will be uh, put in place as far as possible, and it also talks about uh, that the data for those under 16 will be treated with particular sensitivity or more sensitivity. I just, I just wondered if you could expand on exactly what that means in terms of more sensitivity uh, um, uh, in relation to young people's data, and in particular the safeguards that the bill would bring uh, in relation to those under 16. Essentially, the, um, the, 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 the contents of the bill uh, are designed to ensure that only electoral registration officers and those working for them will have access to information on those aged under 16. So essentially out of the, um, the, the collection of information about who would be eligible to vote within the 14 to 15 year old age group, that information would be held by the electoral registration officers and only available to, to those who work for them. Um, the, there are three limited circumstances uh, in which that information can be um, made available to um, anybody else. Um, and the, the, uh, the breach of that duty would result in a, would, would be, would constitute a criminal offence. So it's at the, the highest level of, um, of scrutiny in that respect. Um, information on 14, 15 year olds will be suppressed from any version of the full local government register that's published sold or otherwise made available. So that would, would just be out of that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that version. However, shortly before an electoral event, 
returning officers, the electoral commission and candidates will be entitled to a copy of the register for electoral purposes. Um, and of course that comes with the, the similar uh, issues around statutory offences for unauthorised use. Uh, that version of the register will contain details of those entitled to vote who are already aged 16 or over, or those who will become 16 on or before the date of the electoral event. So in practice, only those aged 15 years and 46 weeks and upwards would be on that more publicly available register. Um, the only other exception to the principle that um, electoral registration officers and their staff can't disclose information is where it's necessary for the purposes of a criminal investigation or criminal proceedings in relation to issues around voter registration. Um, so there are very limited circumstances in which any of this information can leave the or, or can be accessed by anyone other than those involved in the electoral registration office and their staff and any unauthorised disclosure of that information carries with it the risk of criminal penalty as a consequence. Thank you very much for that. Um, there was some discussion last week about um, whether or not there was a possibility of uh, other groups, organisations accessing some of this data. You seem to be very clear that that would not be the case. The examples given were, for example, credit agencies and, and other organisations who legitimately, <coughs> legitimately access the, uh, the record um, of electoral data. Well, I can expressly rule out the fact, that, make clear that the credit agencies will not have access to that information on, um, uh, on uh, under-16s. Okay, that's good. Um, can I just ask one other question, convener, which is to do with those um, children, young people, um, I should say, young people who, um, for very obvious reasons, uh, may not wish their name to be published on an electoral register um, because of their particular family circumstances, uh, those fleeing um, difficult situations such as abuse um, and a whole variety of other reasons. I, I just wondered if you could expand on what the government's view is on protecting the interests of those in young individuals um, who unfortunately find themselves in such circumstances, but at the same time allowing them to fully participate in the electoral process. I, I think there's, there's two points I'd make in response to Mr Maxwell's question. The first is to say that there is provision for anonymous registration, and um, that exists um, where there is, it is judged by um, a court order or interdict or the view of a chief social worker or a police officer above the rank of superintendent that the safety of an individual or someone living at them would be at risk if the register disclosed their name and address. So there is a, there is a specific mechanism which enables anonymous registration and participation. So that in a statutory basis, the circumstances that Mr Maxwell raises are entirely covered by the bill. Second point I'd say, however, is that that's only as good as people are aware that that's an option. And if people are not aware that's an option, then that is at risk that that young person may not actually be able to do, as Mr Maxwell suggests, to fulfil their democratic participation. So in the awareness raising around this question, in the whole registration process, there has to be an understanding that it is possible to undertake anonymous registration in these circumstances that I've set out. And it's important that that point is understood and reflected more widely within, um, within the process. And, and you come to my final point, which is exactly that. You, you have, what, is the, what, are, what, excuse me, what are the circumstances uh, that you envisage in, in terms of the, the process that will be undertaken by whether it be local authorities or um, electoral registration officers or the electoral commission um, in order to ensure that these uh, families and these individuals, and particularly these young people, will be provided with that information that you said so correctly that they should be <coughs> in, entitled to? The, 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 the general canvas process will, is designed to identify all those individuals that are eligible to be on the register and, and, and able to vote. And in that process, um, the circumstances of individuals who may need to be registered anonymously would, I think, would, would crystallise. Because individuals, I can only assume, would present and say, I'm, you know, I'm 
concerned about my name being on that register because of whatever issues of, of, of implications there may be. I think the key test is that those who are handling such information must have at the front of their mind that there is another option for those individuals, rather than saying, oh, well, if you don't want to register, you don't register. Yeah. As a, or, or we can say there is a mechanism, if there is an issue of safety or circumstances, that there is another option available for anonymous registration. And I think that's the making sure that awareness is there, um, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that that is the case. And there's obviously also the proactive responsibility of local authorities as a corporate parent to identify individuals who uh, it is highly likely they are going to be involved in supporting these individuals because of their circumstances can actually, as part of that process, actively say to those individuals, well, you should be registered to vote, but because of your circumstances, it shouldn't be disclosed where you, your name and your address, and therefore there's a mechanism we can put in place to sort that and to make it easier. But, but crucially, um, those involved in the electoral process have to have that option at the front of their minds in articulating that to young people. Thank you very much. Mark McDonnell. Thank you, Just following on from that, one of the discussions that we had last week related to um, the issue of attainers and the uh, issue of donations. I'll just quote you from uh, the evidence given by Andy O'Neill, where he says, another issue that we need to think through relates to donations. Under the bill, a person who is 14 years and nine months is likely to be an attainer on the register. It may be improbable, but if the law on registers remains the same, we think that an attainer can be a donor or a lender to a political party or a candidate. Uh, the issue for candidates and political parties on regulated donors is that the permissibility of donations of more than £500 must be checked. If they cannot access the donor's details, that would create an issue. I just wonder if that's an issue that the Scottish Government has had flagged up to it before now, or if it's something that you, you have any consideration on how you might address. Um, certainly, I, th I think what Mr O'Neill has, has said is, 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 is absolutely the case. We would, um, we would agree that um, the proposals in the bill mean that 14 and 15 year olds will be entitled to be registered as attainers on the local government register and therefore will be permissible donors. Uh, there is then um, a practical issue given the answers that uh, I've just given to, um, to, 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 to Mr Maxwell, that um, that information would not be readily available to political parties to check uh, as to whether the, um, a, they are um, it wouldn't be available to, local th to political parties to check whether the individual was on the register. The way around this um, is that young people would be able to obtain a letter from the electoral registration officer to confirm that they were on the register and they themselves could make that available to the political party to satisfy the political party's obligations in terms of the um, political parties and elections act. Um, which will specify the basis of the obligation on political parties to ensure donations are compliant. So would it be your expectation that that would be spelled out in the guidance that accompanies the legislation in order that... Uh, we to, certainly, to will, that we certainly will make that, uh, that, that option clear. Um, whether it will be in the guidance, uh, I, I'll consider the contents of that in due course. Okay. Um, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, the Law Society and the Howard League have both given us some views on prisoner voting and compliance issues under ECHR. What's the government's views on that? The, the issue um, is, is essentially constrained by the contents of the representation of the People Act 1983, which is reserved legislation. Um, section 3 of the Representation of the People's Act um, 1983 uh, includes a ban on prisoner voting across the United Kingdom. Um, we have no ability to vary that legislation, that is reserved legislation. Um, so therefore, um, the issue of prisoner voting is determined and defined by um, the by the contents of the representation of the people of that 1983. Okay. I don't think there's any other, any other questions, Deputy First Minister. I'm very grateful to you and your officials.
coming along and giving us evidence today. Very helpful. I will just suspend for one minute until we, before we go into the next item of business. Thank you very much.